Good morning. How's everybody doing? Good. I'm Dave Masovich, um, CEO of a company called Mass Solutions, which is an integrated marketing firm based here in Pittsburgh. Based only a few blocks away, however, it was far enough away that I still got drenched walking over from the humidity. So I'm here today to talk to you a little bit about digital marketing. My background is uh, been in marketing my entire life, I'd say. And at this point, I'm doing a lot of workshops and speaking under the no bullshit marketing mantra. So we have some gifts for those of you that participate the most. Uh, and I speak a lot to C-suite people, CEOs, CFOs, heads of marketing, chief marketing officers. And I try to talk about how nobody sets out to be a BS marketer. Yet it happens to all of us from time to time. So today what I'm going to talk about is just a little bit about where we were with digital marketing, where we are, and where it looks like we're going to be. So it's small groups, interactive. I'll try to stay on camera a little bit, I guess, for the live stream. But I roam around a bit. Feel free to interrupt me at any point. And when we get into some of the deeper parts of ideas that I have for anyone, whether they're a podcaster, a marketer, a CEO, there's ideas that we all should be applying. Maybe you're applying some of them, uh, hopefully applying some of them, and we'll work to help you apply as many more of them as you can to help build your personal brand and spread the word. Uh, let's see, what else? Uh, I guess that's a little bit about me as far as the intro. I like to start off by going way, 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 way back in time, all the way back to like 2003, 2004, and uh, look where we were. So in the early days, you know, Wi-Fi was this big deal, and in 2003, 2004, Panera built a business model around free Wi-Fi, and it shows you how quickly things have changed in about a 10-year period. So this is the iMac Panera guy which back in 2004, this went viral. And you talk about turning a Panera into your personal office. That's, that's being a little bit abusive, I'd say. But it's, it's, I use that slide to start because it shows in a 10-year period how much change we've had. I can remember when I'd be driving two appointments, I would actually, actually go on a website to see where there were Wi-Fi locations that I could go to. McDonald's, uh, there was a McDonald's in West Virginia that would charge $3.99, and in between appointments I'd rush there and uh, pay $3.99. So the game has changed and it continually changes. Speaking of changes, this was what we used to find our way around as little as 2005, 2006 MapQuest. The first major social media outlet, MySpace. Who was on MySpace? Come on, give it up. Yeah, all right. Uh, and then look how pretty LinkedIn was, look how beautiful that is. And to be on LinkedIn and connect with anyone, you had to personally know them, which pretty much meant that we all had like 12 connections. And uh, then it finally expanded there, so we'll talk about that. Uh, so uh, way back then, you also had got your news from TV, radio, uh, on-air radio talk show was, was huge. Talk, talk radio was the biggest thing. But where are we going to today? You know, we have now Google Maps. And, like, I like to talk a lot about branding. That's what our company does. But think about MapQuest, how, as a brand, they've died. But yet Google Maps is now commonplace. Facebook is now being used. It's replaced social media. It's huge. Uh, we'll talk about the details of where that's going. And then LinkedIn got a lot prettier and uh, got a lot more efficient. One of the things that uh, Bill Gates famously had a speech in 1996, he talked about how content is king. And the problem with that speech was it led everyone to think that it meant more content, more, 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 more content. So content is king became internet memes, it became pushed by Google, speakers spoke about it, and what it led to was a lot of garbage content because people thought everyone had to have a blog and that everyone should put out as many posts as they can. And content itself is not king. Your target audience is king. So when you think, focus on content being king, the flaw that happens is it's a bunch of garbage content that we ignore. 
So that phrase, content is king, has been made fun of rightfully so because BS marketers and BS content people make it about themselves instead of the target audience. So one of the key things of today is that content is still king as a, a phrase in a negative way, but we're finally seeing the shift to the content and making it about them. Now, where are we going to be in the near future? Well, this guy right here, that's what I want to get for my place. So I want to make sure I have one of those. But uh, marketing automation is going to continue to expand and become much more usable by everybody. And it's not going to matter which vehicle. HubSpot created the phrase inbound marketing. They created the term. Think about that. They build a platform. They create a whole product line around their company and what they do. And then the phrase inbound marketing becomes pretty commonplace for anyone that's involved with podcasting, anyone that's involved with marketing, anyone that's involved with PR, anyone that's involved with communications. But it doesn't matter if it's HubSpot. It doesn't matter what type of marketing automation you use. It could be as simple as Infusionsoft or MailChimp. It doesn't have to be the high end. It doesn't have to be Salesforce. So many of my clients that use Salesforce end up spending hundreds of thousands of dollars because they started off thinking Salesforce.com is the way to go. This is fantastic. I can get this for a small monthly fee per salesperson. And then they end up having to spend fifty, hundred, two hundred thousand dollars $200,000 to adapt Salesforce to what they need. So my point is it's not about the type of marketing automation. It's just the fact that believe in marketing automation. Find a way to make marketing automation work for you regardless if you're one individual person marketing your own podcast or whether you're marketing for clients because you built your own social media business or you're a director of marketing and communications at a healthcare system. You just need to apply marketing automation so you're able to get the message out to your target audiences. And again, if that content is quality and not garbage, you'll be in good shape. So that's one of the things that's going on today and will be in the future. The mobile app development has exploded so much that it's now basically affordable for all of us. So we need to make sure we utilize mobile. The, the usage of mobile in purchases and finding information is so huge and will only continue to grow. One of the key things that's happening and will continue to grow more in the future is native advertising. And there's a lot of talk about how native advertising is BS because native ads basically try to make the ads look like the content. And so they, the, the premise is that we'll be more uh, willing to look at the ads because it looks just like the content. We're not fools. We know it's ads. So I don't know if anybody thinks that it's actually fooling us that we thought it was content. But it has worked better than the previous form of trying to force banner ads and so forth. So native advertising will continue to grow. And the key comes back to that first point. If the content is not just about content for the sake of content, if the content is built around your target market, then it doesn't matter if you're using native advertising, doesn't matter if you're using HubSpot or Salesforce.com. If you're targeting the right people, and you're building that content for them, sometimes even by them, that's how you can spread your message. So the key things that I've been trying to uh, emphasize very early here are, number one, know who the target is. Know who the target is. And drill that down into the smallest, most manageable segment. Far too many times, companies that we work with will say they have this big, broad target audience. We're working with a company is one of the top food truck manufacturers in the world. And with food trucks expanding, they came to us and said, they actually made trucks for FedEx. That's what they did. They made trucks for FedEx. And their CEO, who's a visionary, said about three years ago, well, we already have these trucks. Why don't we adapt and create another market? Let's create a food truck market. So they started out and said, we can reach anybody and sell food trucks. But when they came to us, we said, well, what's your biggest segment within the food truck market? And they hadn't really looked. And so we worked with them, and there was a decision made that a company that had at least two or three locations, but not hundreds, would be good for them. So think here in Pittsburgh, a place like Atrias is a good target for them. Why? Because the mom and pop, when they buy a food truck, that might be 
it. That might be all they can afford if they can afford it. So the mom and pop place that has one fantastic restaurant isn't as good of a target because A, they might not buy. It's going to take a lot of time to close them because of their size. B, once they buy, you're done. They're probably not going to buy again. Somebody huge that has hundreds of locations across the country sounds like it might be the better target, but it actually isn't because then you're competing with all the national players. So what we were able to do was drill down for them. We were actually able to pick the top foodie markets, of which Pittsburgh's one of them. And we were able to show them just in Columbus, Ohio, they could have 72 companies with the Atrius type model that had four to 25 locations. So now we've drilled down that target market. So now when we create the content for them, we know exactly what they look like, what they feel like, what they smell like, where they are, what they buy. So now content truly can be king. If we'd have just pushed out content all across the restaurant industry, it would have been garbage because the, the owner of Applebee's would have thought very differently than the owner of the ribbon in New York City who thinks a little bit differently than one local restaurant here in Pittsburgh. So we changed their thinking by deciding who is the target market, slicing it down as small of a segment as you could get, and be able to say, we said, here's the top 12 foodie markets where we think you can get food truck business. And then we sliced that into saying, here's how many Atrias-like companies there are. And now let's build a message just for that. That's when content is king because we flipped it and made the target audience king. The target audience is king. We're the king. Whatever you buy and I want to sell you, you're the king about that. I have to queen, I should say. I, I, I have to find a way to make that all about you so that it works for you. And that's what I'm talking about with all this stuff that we showed you. Native advertising is good. It looks good and it gets in there, but it still has to be about us, what we want at that time when we take a look at it. And then, of course, podcasting has continued to proliferate. But the biggest piece of creative for us, for us as creatives, is video. You know, if I were to take Bill Gates' speech and change it today, I would make video king. So when it comes down to content, the audience is king because you have to decide who they are. But the way to reach them, you have to incorporate video now. And the DIY, the do-it-yourself approach, is fine, as you all know because of how much YouTube is dominated. So when you're marketing yourself, or you're marketing your podcast, or you're marketing your own personal brand, or you're marketing your company, and if you work at a company that's conservative, they will be so nervous about video. And they'll want it to be this high-end production. That's great. Call Mass Solutions, we can do that for you. Great. But the reality is, a lot of the video work can be done either in-house or with lower end to medium end production. You don't need to have, when I was at UPMC, when we would shoot a commercial, we, we shut down the uh, north side and the south side for the same shoot because we were doing certain spots. Just the budget for that shoot, just the donuts and coffee was a bigger budget than many companies have. And that's the commercial where it ends with the, the woman running to the point in the morning and at one globally won awards. It's 10, 12 years old, still talked about. Don't need that kind of quality video content for us. For us. UPMC is one of the biggest companies in the, in the world. It's got 50,000 people in the organization. You don't have to be like that. The do-it-yourself approach or using uh, a freelance video person or using a small production company, that can be what you do. But you have to convince whatever company you're with that video has to be a big piece of all of your content. Video storytelling has to drive your content. And if it's for your podcast, video has to drive it. Video has to tell the story about what makes your, your podcast great. And the three words that I want you to leave with today with your digital marketing strategy and for the future are acquire, engage, and retain. Acquire, engage, and retain. We need to acquire the people that are in that segment. That company has to get that small Atrius-like restaurant. They have to know who all those are, and they have to acquire them somehow. They have to get them to raise their hand and say, I want more information. I want more information. Think about it. 
We don't want to be bothered by advertising. We don't want to be talked at. We want to raise our hand and say, I'll take stuff from you. And if you stink, I'm going to unsubscribe. Okay, so we want to acquire. But then once we acquire them, we have to engage them so that we're, we're making it about them. We're showing them that, yes, you raised your hand and we're giving you something valuable because you are important. You're the target. We're giving you something in value, that's invaluable to you that you can use. If you can't use it, you put your hand down and you unsubscribe. So first we have to acquire, then we have to engage you, and then we have to retain you. So the digital landscape today, we're now seeing, I showed you that last, at the beginning I showed you one of everything that's today, and there was one for a Pittsburgh podcast Facebook page. And the Facebook pages were so basic, and I'm showing this podcast one now because as you see these, the, the level of interactivity has grown so much. And that's the key, because you're making it that once someone is engaged with us as podcasters, we then have to make sure that we engage them so we can retain them. So when you're doing anything on Facebook, you know, the big phrase that I heard for years is, well, let me ask you guys, where do you think the biggest growth on Facebook has been four straight years? Biggest growth on Facebook as far as users? Who, where's the biggest increase of users on Facebook been each of the past four years? Citizens. And why is that? Because uh, they followed uh, the find where their grandkids are posting. Exactly. So that's that's the that's a true stat. That's a true stat. So then people go, well, I don't need to reach seniors. I don't need to be on Facebook. But the reality of Facebook is this: the highest level of engagement. Remember, it's about acquire, engage, and retain. The highest level of engagement on Facebook: thirty-five to fifty-five year old women. 35 to 55 year old women. And that is the biggest, most important target to reach. 35 to 50 year old women make the decisions and rule the world. In my house, a 35 to 55 year old woman range makes the decisions. We all fall in line. And that's good. But seriously, for healthcare, as you can see, women make the healthcare decision dominate it, drive that, so we had to always be cognizant of that. So right now, I'm not at UPMC, but UPMC, I'm sure, is focusing on that 35 to 55-year-old female on Facebook because they're engaged, and they engage with brands. They engage with brands. So the grandparents engage to see the pictures of the kids, but the grandparents aren't changing their decisions and their purchase behavior based on Facebook, whereas 35 to 55-year-old men and women are doing that. They're engaging with brands on Facebook. So yes, Tom is correct. The biggest growth has been with grandparents, but the, the key target audience for all of us to reach, if you're working for a company that has to reach someone to make a purchase decision, you have to be able to reach 35 to 50 year old women. If you're starting a podcast and you don't think you're gonna get 35 to 55 year olds to listen, you, 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 that's where we have to change. That's where the podcasting industry has to change. We have to get more of people in that demo. We've got the young people. We've gotta get more people in that demo. Now let's talk about Google, because there's a major change that's happened in Google as well. So 2.3 million searches a second. At all but China, in Europe, they have 89% uh, of the whole market in Europe. In the United States, they have 75%. In China, they have zero because they pulled out. But other than China, they're dominant. So 75% of the US market and 89% of the mobile market. And I think this 50% of us using it on mobile is going to go up, right? It's going to only go up. So right now, 2.3 million searches a second. Half of those searches are on mobile, and that's going to go up. And that's why I had that mobile slide up earlier. We've got to change our content to fit to mobile to make people that can absorb it easily on mobile. 75% of the U.S. market, 89% of the mobile market. So they're dominating the mobile market. Now, here's where there's been a change, and check this out. Okay, so what we click on... The top listing used to dominate, and Tom will relate to this. Tom's my man, he, he's a marketing guru, a direct marketing guru. So five years ago, 10 years ago, way back when, when I started 2004, remember I said we're going to go way back, a whole 12 years. If you didn't get on that first or second uh, search listing, guys like Tom and I would get fired for not getting our companies on the first or second. But that's changed. That used to be 80% and it used to be something like 97% didn't go to page two. I've always been a weirdo. I go to page two on the searches. I'm like one of three people. 
do. But now the top two or three listings are only 33% of the traffic. And it goes back to my earlier point about native advertising. We're now getting smarter that a lot of times that first one looks like it might be a paid ad, so we go to the second one. We also have the time. We'll go look at the second one. We'll look at the third. Hey, I might even pop down here and look at the fifth one. So 88% go to the top six. So this changes the game for us as trying to get ourselves and our company up in those listings. We have a little more wiggle room. In the old days, if you were starting out as a company, and you were a healthcare system, and you were small, you know UPMC was going to be one, two, three, four, five, because we were out there pounding. I was making sure we had people out getting stories in the papers, getting stories in, on TV. We were pushing ads. So we had one, two, three, four. <coughs> you were done if you entered something. Now, we're willing to look at the six. We're willing to even go to page two a little bit. So that changes the game for us. Yes, sir. Yeah, it used to be Google had, I'm feeling lucky. And so what pushed ahead got number one didn't even see the others. Exactly. And Exactly. So what does that mean to us? Remember, content is king if you pick the target and you made it about them. So if you know that I'm 35 to 55 and I'm going to go look for something about Basketball. I'm a basketball guy. Readily try to be honest about myself. And so I'm going to get my picture taken with the Lawrence O'Brien trophy with my three sons. Uh, and that's the NBA's championship trophy because I have uh, Cavs season tickets. So I will be driving to Cleveland next week to get pictures taken. So if you want to reach me about something about the NBA, you've got to know that if you, if you get it to where it's content that I'm looking for and I search that term, and you're in one of the top six, you're fine. It no longer has to be the top one, like he said. So it changes the game. This is hugely critical to all of us as producers of content. We now have a better chance if we pr produce our content for a specific sliced and diced segment, then we'll be in those top six if we use the right keywords. And then with your uh, SEO, build a site with customers in mind. Now, has anyone heard of Jacob Nielsen? Jacob Nielsen is a web guru. You guys should take that name, look at it. Not Nielsen Ratings for TV, which is old, dead stuff. Jacob Nielsen is a web guru. He has, about 15 years ago, he began tracking our eyes, how we look at things. And there's goggles before Google goggles, which he'd bring people in to go look at sites, and you'd have the goggles on. And so it used to be that uh, we didn't want to click at all and you used to have to click a lot so that's when rollovers came big because Jacob Nielsen proved that we all did a certain thing and only wanted two clicks and where we looked at it. We used to make a Z. This is how we used to look. We used to make a Z. We'd start go across, slide down and go across. Now we make a capital F. We start, we go over, we come down about a third of the way, we slide halfway over, we come down to the last paragraph. So now what have we done? based on Jacob Nielsen. We've made our websites, our, our teams of people that work in our field, and now make websites where we tend to scroll more. There's not as much clicking to anything. You just scroll the whole way down. So think in terms of that. That's how we're reading now. We're reading in a capital F. We're reading in a capital F. So you know how I write? I write a blog, like reading. Subscribe to it, MassSolutions.biz. Sign up, because out every two weeks, it's been, uh, Publishing over 50 media outlets. One of my guys came to me a year or two ago and said, We hit our millionth reader. I was like, Great. I don't even know what that means, but great. I was going to say that in a speech and feel good about it. So I tend to write the big headline, big image, big headline. I try to hook you with that first sentence. Then I know that you're probably going to go to the middle, so I try to put in something in the middle that's bolded. That's a key takeaway that I really feel is important to you. Then I close with something. If you want more, you'll go back. Now I'm a reader. But I'm not the norm, so I can't write for me. Because I love to read. I read whole books. It's amazing. I feel like a dinosaur. I get a book and read it the whole way through. That's not done, okay? But I can't write for me. That's not what everybody else does. Everybody else scans. They scan in a capital F on the web. So you have to write that way. Produce your content that way. Think in those terms. I'm not saying to throw away everything after the lead. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying it's how you package it. Package that the lead in the first sentence carries it. Around the middle, make sure you did something with bullets or bold or an image or a pull-out pull quote, a stat. And then close with a sentence that's going to kill. Okay? 
This is what I'm talking about. You have to make your content about them. And so build your website the same way. Look at how our navigation is. This is all built from Jacob Nielsen. All of the sites that we build, we make them look different. We make them unique to that target market. We make them have the imagery and the colors of the client, but we stick to a theme that follows what Jacob Nielsen has proven we do. Now, within the next two or three years, it'll change. The Z was only seven years ago. So for four or five years, the Z design. Now we're in the capital F design. C, capital F. Boom, cross navigation, came down the middle, made image, boom, closed out. Questions? Because I get gone. Going back to, to drilling down into your target market. Yes. Okay. We drilled down. We found what our market is. Yes. Now, how do we find? I mean, I, I go way back to direct mail, pre-internet. Yes. I'm, I'm an entertainer. I have my database of festivals. Okay. When I started, I could go to a mailing list company and say, I want all festivals that have five to 10,000 people. Uh, I need an address for them uh, in the state of Pennsylvania. And then they'd say, well, that list is $100, 200 or whatever right. it was, depending right. on how many names were there. Does that exist for? Well, I today? love to keep people interactive, so I'm going to put Tom on the spot, but I'm also going to give him a shirt. Tom, what size would you like? Extra large? Okay. Extra large. Okay, so Tom, jump in. Tom's a, a direct marketing guru, and I'm going to add on this answer because I don't want to put him on the spot. But jump in. How would you answer that? Yeah, it's like a, a lot of times I'm in B2B mode, and I think about how to target and find uh, an audience of appropriate companies and titles within those companies. But what, what you're talking about is a little bit different. I think it's going to take a number of efforts to kind of slowly cultivate a quality list. And maybe it's about engaging and creating some content to get them to, to raise get their hand. Some of those well, I'm not talking just yeah. for money market. Yes. I'm talking for any market. Well, what, what the key is, yes, go ahead. Oh, I just wanted to. Jump in. We, I'm from a company called Spark Designs. We do digital marketing. Um, uh, Facebook for Business has an audience insights tool that we use religiously um, just to kind of get boots on the ground type of deal. Um, we type in what we think our audience is, um, what we think they might be interested in, um, where they're located, things like that. And it actually pulls up age ranges. Um, male, female, what other pages they might be interested in, um, where they're located, if they're using mobile versus desktop, um, if they're families of four, what their income is, things like that. And it kind of helps us tailor ads going into it. Mm -hmm. um, and then we kind of, um, on each site, have contact forms that people can fill out. And from there, we just keep those email addresses and market towards those audiences. Um, you can also plug in your lists on Facebook as well with those ads. Um, and target those people as well as people who are connected to them, and you can kind of pinpoint your audience from there. Um, at least on the online market. Great stuff. Would you rather have a shot glass or a book? Let's see what what you got here. <laughs> the twenty-one year old in me wants that, want but. <laughs> Thank you. All right. So, so to her point and and to Tom's point, there's a couple things out. She's exactly right. Facebook's a huge opportunity for you or anyone else to go and dig into on the business side. LinkedIn is incredible. If you're B2B, Tom, Tom and I use LinkedIn like crazy. I'm sure you do as well. But then once you start trying to drill it, I also use Factiva uh, and Statista, which are two uh, subscription-oriented research companies. Okay, now, you're not ready to do that as an individual, but a company like mine or hers can buy those kind of things. Statista is one, Factiva is another. Uh, but once you start building the list, then you have to try to get the content that gets them to raise their hand. And she said and he said, get them to raise their hand, get them to ask for more. Then you have to use that slide. Remember the slide about marketing automation? What do you guys use marketing automation-wise? You use in HubSpot, you use in Infusionsoft, Marketo. Um, I've used HubSpot before, but we use Hootsuite. 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 Okay, so you got to have something. That's another one. should be on that slide, actually. So Hootsuite, uh, Marketo, HubSpot, Salesforce.com. Hootsuite is a great resource for finding businesses, if you want to find specific consumers, I think there's a lot of panel companies out there that has really specialized niches that help you to find certain groups of people that do a very spe you know, specialized yes. thing. It's real easy to still do what you did in the old days, to get addresses. It's a little more expensive to get email addresses. Yeah. So 
But there's all kinds of different things as she was bringing up. Both both of these young ladies did as well. Uh, other questions? Well, Great stuff. Go that, ahead. That leads me to another question. At what point does direct mail marketing come back around because it's going to be unique again? I don't know that it ever went away. I mean, it's never been like look. Well, I, success I with direct mail campaigns, well, even in the nineties, a six percent response rate was phenomenal. You know, I know so. it's never gone away, but I, I get less and less junk mail in my mailbox as, as a person. Yes. Uh, at what time is it going to be? Going back to my own market festivals, uh, that the festival organizer is going to go. Oh wow! I just got a letter from somebody. Let's go look at their website. Let's go look at their online presence because this is kind of unique. There's going to be a mix of everything you do from, from all the since the beginning of time. There's had to be a mix of what you do, um, and direct mail still plays a role in that. It's all about once you define that target and look at your budget, and what you can do. I can tell you right now that when you send a personalized letter or a thank you to someone, it's so a thank you. I have thank yous on my desk. When I get a thank you, I actually keep it. I don't know why. I feel guilty throwing it away. So there's a thank you from like a year ago from a chief market officer of a large healthcare system. And I, it's on my desk. Okay. So when you still take the time to do a personal snail mail letter, letter, a postcard, or a thank you, those still do work. And they're still a piece of what you do. But it all comes back to the beginning of using the resources that we've been mentioning here to build your list and drill it down as best you can. And markings that aren't on the science, so you're going to fail. You're going to strike out. It's just like baseball. If you bet 300 in baseball, if you, you know, that's, that's, that's good. If you're in basketball, if you shoot 52%, you're, you're doing great. Same thing's going to happen with this. You're, you're going to have to accept that whatever medium you use, you're still having a lot of waste. That's just impossible to, to avoid. The great thing about online is it enables us to be much more targeted than 20 years ago. We can have much more details on the ROI than in the past. In the past, you truly could get away. You could get away with ambiguity in the past. And I fought that my entire career because a lot of people would just go, we ran a great commercial and we know people saw it. So there were people that didn't have any analytics behind them that were successful in marketing because they could kind of fake it. And that drove me crazy because I thought they were BS marketers. I think if you were... <coughs> Even 50 years ago, you could have had some science behind your marketing. Well, now you can have a lot of detail behind your marketing. And it's changing the game because it's enabling us to get a better seat at the table. We're still, we're still not at the table like a CFO, but we're getting closer to getting at the table like we should be. And the real drivers, the real Fortune 500 consumer companies, the chief marketing officer has a seat right next to the CFO. It's whenever you're in these other industries. You know, healthcare is a good example, one where... The chief marketing officer doesn't quite have the clout, except for at a place like UPMC, and that's why they're number one, because Jeffrey Romoff understood marketing and turned us loose. Jeffrey Romoff's the CEO of UPMC. So LinkedIn, remember when I said those first six search items, right? Well, what's the first one that's going to come up about any of us if we did it right? LinkedIn. So we should be doing LinkedIn on ourselves if we're professionals because it's going to come up first or second who controls what's on your LinkedIn page I teach at a lot of different places uh, I'm going to be teaching here at Point Park soon but I had a class this semester at Indiana University of Pennsylvania and I do this every class and I was this way and I, I would have fell prey to this a professor could have done this to me but I come into the class and I say there's five of you that I read about in the paper what do you think I've read about you guys at the Indiana Gazette? And I said, nobody has to tell me their name, don't. In fact, don't. What do you think it was? What do you think I saw? Negative. Police, police reports. Uh, <laughs> underage drinking police reports. <laughs> they have no control over that. That came up when I Google. Because I Google all my students. I have 33 students. I Google each one. And I look at them. And I say to them, by the time you're a junior or senior, you've already done more than generations before you have done as a junior or senior. There are internships after sophomore year, internships after freshman year, you're doing stuff on your own, you're creating content. So build a LinkedIn page because you control that. The DUI, or the, the drinking citation will go down to fourth or fifth. People will still see it because we go to the sixth one. But the point is, you control the first one. So build that LinkedIn profile. The other thing I say is, 
You have to have a picture on it. I just don't understand people that don't put a picture on LinkedIn. Like, why would you do that? So we, we call it the profile police when we go into a client. And one client to work with right now is Phoenix, and I asked the CFO, CFO, CEO if I could put him on for this presentation yesterday when I was talking to his group, and I said, I'll tell you why. I said, you have a good profile. And he had a good profile before we worked with him. They had 280 employees, and only, and they're all professional level. They're one of those rare companies that, I shouldn't say all, but 90% are professional level because they're physical therapists, they're facility directors, they're VPs of this and directors of that. They have very few line people, line being you know, entry level type positions, so they all need to be on. When we walked in, they had 80 people out of their 283 on LinkedIn. We pumped that up and we got all but a few stragglers. Of the 80, like 48 didn't even have a picture. The one person had a picture and on their shirt, they had a name tag from the company they were at before Phoenix. I called that person directly. I said, anyone else, you just call me. I said, change this before anyone looks, because we're in the midst of this program. You're going to look real bad. I said, we won't tell you, but I'll, tell, I'll, use it, I'll use it without saying your name when I speak, but I won't tell you about it. So look at the good and bad. Okay, the bad is, you know, you had Joe profile, no picture. They didn't even have experience. Look, look at this. Look at this. They're a beginner over here. Who wants to be a beginner? No photo, no education. And over here, he's got a strong summary with good keywords based, written by him, written by the CEO. Uh, he has his actual experience. He has his education. He actually, beyond this part here, I, I don't want to show all the personal, he joined groups. How many times do you see a CEO of a large company doing this? He joined groups related to physical therapy. He joined groups related to CEOs of physical therapy companies. That's, that's making it happen. That's rocking it. So now when you, when you Google Phoenix, David Watson's name will come up. When you Google David Watson, his LinkedIn profile comes up. you got everything you need about David Watson. If you leave it like this, or if you don't have one, you got the DUI, you got the citation, you got whatever you got in trouble. You got, if you got fired and made the papers. You control what's on LinkedIn. To your point, at the Tom's point, LinkedIn's an amazing, amazing, amazing database. It's an amazing data. If you aren't using LinkedIn as a database, you need to start. If it's you because you're early in your career, you might think of another job, that's one reason. But if it's you want to sell something, you can very quickly narrow down. When I go in to see a client, I not only know who I'm going to see, I know who their boss is, and I know who their boss's boss is. So I have that information. I went to a sales call the other day, and I, the person I was meeting with went to Robert Morris. And I also knew she ran the cheerleading for a local school district. I didn't know if I'd use that in any way, but it took eight seconds to read it. So we happened to be talking, and she said, oh, you're at Duquesne. And I told the story about how when Duquesne, when I came to Duquesne, they thought they were all high and mighty, and they thought they were still part of the big three. And I had to get in front of a room of people and tell them, let me tell you something. This is a long time ago. I said, let me tell you, you're not in the big three, and you're not with Carnegie Mellon. And I just did the research to prove it. And let me show you what we found out. You're still good. But they thought that Georgetown was where people applied and Duquesne was a fallback to Georgetown. And they thought that when you went to Duquesne, your fallback was maybe Robert Morris. But Duquesne people that had as their backup, Kell, an IUP, Clary, and Duquesne was a backup to Pitt. Okay? So we were able to tell that story to the cabinet. I was on the cabinet. I told the cabinet and the board. I thought I might get fired after that presentation. And uh, they weren't happy with me. But then they were great. They, they had leadership. And they said, so we're going to fix it. We're going to fix it. And that's where the Do More campaign came out. Where we said, why do you go to college? You go to college to do more. We have this name that has a problem. Outside of Allegheny and the five contiguous counties, people didn't even know how to pronounce it. Duquesne! <laughs> My office happens to be on Fort Duquesne Boulevard. If you order anything from around the world and they have to relay your address back, they always say Duquesne. I just chuckled. It reminds me back when we were trying to go beyond Allegheny and the five contiguous counties, because Allegheny and the five contiguous counties isn't really growing much and it's getting old. But it's getting a little younger now, but 10 years ago, it's so really bad. So, to Duquesne's credit, what they did was they showcased the good stuff that they had. And they stayed on a par with the Robert Morris, which is also a very good university. Duquesne's good. Point Park's good. Robert Morris is good. 
but nationally, Pitt and Carnegie Mellon are a notch above, and we're not at Georgetown's level, and we're not at Notre Dame's level. Robert Morris isn't, neither is Duquesne. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with that. You have to narrow down who wants to go to your place, drill down that group, segment it, and get them there. So the Do More campaign was playing off of the problem with the name outside of Allegheny. It was playing off of trying to expand. It was playing off of trying to reach the target. And the people that went to Duquesne were very spiritual driven, many of them. So we knew we had that. So do more to help others. So that's how you do your drilling down. And that's how you, uh, you find the details. So it's all about being able to ask the people what they think, find out where you stand. And LinkedIn is a huge, huge, huge database for all of us. Some things to do is to make sure you use headlines, make sure you have a call to action, and keep that profile picture updated. Most people don't have a complete profile, and we're all kind of competitive, so let's get that profile to where we're uh, happy about it. And then post stuff, also this one, set profiles to public. Log in often, look at other profiles. If you can afford premium, if you're at a company and you get your company to pay for premium, or if you're a, a solopreneur and you have your own business, get premium because then you can see who's looking at you, which is very huge because when you see someone looking at you, you can then reach out to them, or you can create a touch, you can create a post for them. I had someone on my podcast the other day, she said, when I'm on the phone with someone that I made a cold call to, she goes, this happens at least four or five times a week. She goes, I'll be on the phone with them, and it'll pop up on LinkedIn that someone checked out my profile. And she's like, I know I got it, because when you go to her profile, she made her profile kick ass. And her profile's written for the people she's going to call on. So as soon as she calls someone, she's sitting at her desk, and it pops up that she has someone looked at her profile and happens to be the person she's on the phone with. She knows that she can now reference certain pieces of that, and she's getting repetition of message, which is what marketing's all about. So she got repetition of message because she knew they were looking at her profile, and her profile talks about them. Because if you write your profile, it should be written about them. The profile should be written about what you want people to do with you. I'll mention my books. I'll mention my podcast. I'll mention my workshop online. But I'll also mention my company. Because some people are going to book me as a speaker. Others are going to decide they want to be on the show, others want my workshop, but that's not where we really make our bread and butter. Our bread and butter is from our clients, so mine has to be written in a difficult manner. It's a challenge. But this person was on my show, she's selling one product, and she has it written that way, and she sees with that premium who went to look at her profile. It's very powerful. And so you want to get the all-star profile strength. Who has an all-star strength in here? Anybody? All right, we got some winners. Good. Uh, and then connect and, and go to groups. It's a great vehicle when you connect with someone. There's a lot to use it for. So let's talk about podcasting. Uh, I showed you that earlier Facebook page and earlier radio uh, piece. You can see how far it's come. And uh, we're getting even more and more. So here's what's happening. You've got increased investment into podcasts. Even more of the basic ones, more of us solopreneurs who are building a podcast, we're making them sound better, we're investing more into the, sh the content and the marketing of it. But nationally, the big players are investing more into podcasts. That's huge. So it's because it means better content, better talent, better distribution, more easy, easy access, and enhanced experience. And when I think of that, that's the way I look at this. You know, many of you have been coming here for years, 10, 11 years. And you know how much podcasting has changed and how stronger it's become. And we had over a billion downloads in 2015. You're seeing the quality of content go up. And my dream is that we have much more visibility of all the ones past the top 100. You know, everybody's serial, oh, Mark Marin, great. And that's wonderful. And I even said, I said, try not to make that slide. One of my designers said, try to make that slide all Mark Marin and serial. Please put some of the normal ones up there. Because that's where I see the trend going. I see all of us picking podcasts that are sliced to us. You know, no bullshit marketing. She's going to go listen to no bullshit marketing. I got it. Right? You She's going to listen to her. Okay? Yeah. That's, that should be because I might hire her someday. 
okay? Or I might subcontract with their company, or they might subcontract with me, okay? And so that's my target. That's my target. Leaders. There's a lot of C-suite people that I interview. So other C-suite people, because they're competitive, oh, if he was on a show, why wouldn't I be on a show? Okay? And so then they, they want to get there. So I want to see all of these other podcasts having their niche much better visibility. That's my, my dream for the next five years. And we're getting there. We're close. We're close. But my closing point to you is you're all brand ambassadors. You're all brand ambassadors for either your personal brand or your company or both. And in this era, everyone has to be a brand ambassador because that's how the winning companies win. Think of who the great companies are at communicating. I talked about UPMC, and a lot of people that work at UPMC will complain a little bit. But in reality, they're a proud group of 55,000 people. They are. They are. They're a proud group. They'll get defensive because there's some negative press recently. That's what the winners do. They create a culture where everyone's a brand ambassador. My company's small. If I don't have every single person juiced up about mass solutions, then I stink. I stink because it's harder for Jeffrey Roma. He's got 55,000 he has to get juice. But think of the companies, the Southwest Airlines, the places that are messaging great. Everyone is the brand of us. The biggest cliche of all that I've used for 10 years, and it's still not, it's still valid. This is still valid. Which would you rather do, walk into Verizon or walk into Apple Store? Which would you rather do? There's no comparison. Verizon's getting better, but it's still no comparison because the Apple people are brand ambassadors. The Verizon, they're getting better. They actually are. Ten years ago, it was horrible. You go in there all stiff and tense like you want to fist fight. Am I right? You want to go in there almost you come in, I want to beat them. I'm getting my new phone. Okay, now it's a little bit better, but still it's tense. You walk in there because they're brand ambassadors. We all have to be brand ambassadors for our personal brand and our company's brand. Now, don't underestimate how important your personal brand is because millennials are going to work 10, 15 places. You know, if I'd love for the people to stay at Mass Solutions 10, 15 years, but I accept that a millennial is probably going to stay a year, 18 months. Whereas for Gen Xers, our resume looked horrible if we had 15 months on it. So your personal brand matters quite a bit. Any questions, comments? I, I have a couple other shirts and shot glasses. Who's going to get you want a shot glass, don't you? I can tell she's going to use this tonight. <laughs> All right, another shirt, another book. Hey, uh, you were you can go and comment that, that came out when you were talking about LinkedIn. You want the shirt or the book at first? Oh, boy. All right. Okay, so what were we going to say? Um, when you were talking about LinkedIn, what crossed my mind when you said that is I went, oh, my God, that's a Farley file that anybody can uh, access. And outside of politics, I don't know how many people know about Farley files. Explain. Uh, Farley Files politician, there was a, a political scientist named Farley who was a manager for a politician, I don't even remember who it was, and he just kept cards, this is going way back, of everybody the politician met. So Joe Public came in, Joe Public is married to Susie Public. Uh, the kids' names are da 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 da. They were born these days. He has these pets. He likes trains. He hates merry-go-rounds. He, and before the po politician saw them, the manager would hand him the Farley card, the Farley card. On yeah. that person, the person would come in and go, "Oh my God, he remembers me." See, now you can do the Farley file and know that he hates merry-go-rounds on his phone. <coughs> but are, are there other question? Yes. You mentioned uh, LinkedIn Premium. Yes. Do you know if there's a, an analytic or anything that does time on page? Do you see how long someone's been on the page? I'm not certain, but I'll bet. Yeah, I'm not. I don't think that I could be wrong. Because that would be good for your... Yeah. If, I, if, I, if, someone looked at my page, if someone looked at my LinkedIn profile and they were there for three seconds, I don't want to call and pester them if there's another person. I'll tell you what I find. I find people, it does show me that they've gone. And then I know, I know, someone's gone back two, three times. That makes sense. But there's just a good likelihood that, that, they, that they think you're okay. Other questions, comments? i quiet up front. Come on, i got to get something from you. Sorry, I'm just jacking up. I'm filling in for dinner later. Okay, <laughs> great, great. Yes. Yeah. 
Me? Yeah. Oh, here, let me give you, uh, this is my business card and this is my podcast card. Anybody else wants it? Other questions, thoughts, comments? Anybody else? All right, who, who wants a t shirt then? I got two left. All right. Let's see what I, I'll let you pick this size. Okay, there's, they run small. They aren't. How you doing? Who wants his last shot glass? Who wants the last shot glass? Oh, I'll give it to you. <laughs> you spoke first. You spoke first. Now you two can do a shot together. All right. Uh, thank you. Stop up and see me if you want to talk more. Hope you enjoyed it.